It uh, looks like you both saying you might come. I would say hurry up. We've got two minutes before we start. But I am recording now. Like I said, I'm hoping this works. I can't hear anything. I'm hoping you guys can hear me. It seems like you can. Um, I guess things will be normal. No one's here. So for those of you online, we will do... Okay, thank you, Larissa. You can hear it. Perfect. For those of you online, we're going to do attendance the same way. Um, you know, uh, we'll just do the keywords. But it's not even eight yet, so I won't do the keywords. I'm just kind of getting the pre -la or the pre lecture out of the way here. While I'm doing that, let me pull some stuff up here. All right, so you guys should see my screen. Normally, I would ask you to confirm that, but in this case, I cannot hear you, so we're just going to have to go with it and assume that you can see me or you can see the screen and that you can hear me. Let me get the slideshow going the way it should go. All right. Um, it's 8 o'clock, so I'll go ahead and give you the first word for attendance. Is going to be computer because I'm having issues with this computer. Um, so yeah, that's the first word for attendance. Really quick, let's do announcements. Let me get this set up, even though no one's here. I have it set up. Um, let's talk about the exam really quick. Almost everybody's taking it. Um, Wait, did you say the first word was computer? Oh, yeah, I can hear you now. Yes, that is the first word. I don't know what happened, but I can hear you. This is great. Anyway. Yes. So into, into the announcements really quick. The exams are done. It's uh, like, I think there's, well, there's a couple of people who still need to take it. Uh, I think really they're not going to, there's one person who's scheduled to take it today at noon. The other person, other people, I don't think they're going to take it, but anyway, I can go ahead and tell you since they're having a, a longer or harder version than you took, I can go ahead and tell you this because they won't have this option. Um, let's start right there in the middle. Extra credit slash exam review. If you watched, remember I did an exam review. No one showed up. I get it. It was outside of class hours. Maybe you couldn't make it. Um, but then in the video, I mean, I went through every single question. I said, this is, this is going to be on the exam. This won't be on the exam. Here's the right answer. Here's the wrong answer. Here's how I might reword it for the exam. I did all that with every single question. And then I even said, there's going to be a really weird extra credit question on the exam. It's going to make absolutely no sense. And the answer is going to be tissue. And I said, if you got that, then you would get a 10% boost on your grade. So all you had to do is watch the exam review video and you would have had that 10% boost. So keep that in mind next time for exam two. Um, speaking of exam two, whoops, <clears throat> excuse me. If you want no time limit for the exams, then you know once, it's, once we know what, when the next exam is gonna be, then contact me, we'll figure out a way to meet in person, I don't want to do it online anymore. So if you're with me and physically take a paper version of the exam right in front of me, whether it's in my office or in this classroom or auditorium, whatever the case may be, you can take as long as you want. Anything other than that is going to have to be 50 limit, 50 minute time limit as we did last exam. Even if you meet me online, I think it's going to have to be a 50 minute time limit. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, oh, yeah, the boost, this third bullet point here. See me for a boost. And I think, I don't remember, I said this in my other class, I don't remember if I told you or not, but from now on, not just with the exam, but with any assignment, if you want a 10, a 5% boost on your grade, visit me during office hours to schedule another time to visit me, and we will talk. If you allow me to give you feedback on your assignment, whether it's a lab or an exam, then I'll give you your 5%, I'll give you a 5% boost just for me to sit down with you and talk to you, like why you got those wrong answers. And maybe even figure out, maybe you do know the right answer. And maybe I'll give you half credit on certain answers anyway. Maybe you just hit the wrong button. I don't know. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. But the point is, whether it's exam or lab, probably not independent work. But um, basically, yeah, if you see me, meet me in office hours or sometime after that, um, we'll give you a 5% boost just for allowing you to do or allowing me to get feedback. Um, you guys just sit down wherever. Yeah, and that's it. So, any questions about this first announcement bullet point about exams or the boost? 
All right. So, yeah. And again, I'm going to remind you throughout the uh, throughout the semester. Come see me. Let me give you feedback and you will get a 5% boost. Oh, yeah. That's what the other thing. I'll give you a 10% boost if you let me record it and share the video with your classmates so they can learn from your mistakes. All right. Also, second bullet point. A lot of you seem to really need help. That's what office hours are for. That's what I'm here for, whether it's office hours or outside of office hours and we schedule it. You don't have to go at this alone. Some of you are doing horribly, but aren't coming to me for help. If you need help, come to me. That's what I'm here for. You can get to see a tutor if you want, but I'm the one who's grading the papers and grading the exams and writing the exams. So come see me if you need help with work or labs, independent work, getting caught up. A lot of you, not necessarily you guys, I don't know who by faces, but a lot of you really need to get caught up with like attendance and stuff like that. And I tried to make it clear on how you can do that in written instructions, but even if not, come see me and I can help you. Same thing with exam review. Um, you don't have to wait to the official exam review to get an exam review. After you've done a study guide, you can come to me and I can go through it with you, you know, meet me online or whatever. And I'll say, all right, this is the right answer. This is the wrong answer. This is how I might change the question on the exam. This one will be on the exam. This one won't be on the exam. All the same things I did in that exam review, I can do with you one-on-one, -on -one, whenever you want. You don't have to wait for the exam review. And then finally, grades. You guys have access to your grade sheet now. Let me escape out of here very quickly, if I can. There we go. I posted this spreadsheet. Uh, where'd it go? I posted this spreadsheet. You guys have access to it. Obviously, you're going to need help deciphering it. So you'll have to meet me during office hours or outside of office hours so I can tell you how to decipher it. But yes, you have access to all your grades. You can look at your labs, you know, see what you're missing. You can see what you're missing and you can make sure that the grade I told you you got is the actual grade that I put in the grade sheet. You can, you know, be my my double checker. Same thing with independent work. You can see exactly how many points you have so you know where you stand. And again, to double check me to make sure I wrote down what I said you earned. And same thing with attendance. You can see exactly which days you're missing so you can make up those days with the videos and the questions. And again, one last time, you can check to see, make sure I didn't make a mistake. Like you told me I was present this day. And then according to the, my grade sheet, it shows me it's absent. It's a great way to double check me. All right. And then finally, really quick, bringing these two things together, the fact that you have access to the grade sheet and talking about the last exam, even though we still have a few people or a number of people who haven't taken it, the numbers look pretty good. So the average was 72.72. That's a C. That's good. I mean, on average, you would want a C. Um, there were seven A's, seven B's, six C's, one D and four F's. Um, and again, some people haven't taken it. So that might, all those F's might be those people, except maybe one person. Um, if you look at the stats, I don't know what happened. It was very interesting. The people who worked the hardest are actually the ones that got the B. Um, it's because they had the best average grade for study guides and they have the best attendance grade, oddly enough. Um, and the A's, the people who had A's, and no offense to the people that got A's, but I'm thinking maybe there's a, such an artificial boost in the A people. Maybe it's because they saw that exam video and saw where I said, hey, the answer to the extra credit question is tissue. And if you get that, that's a 10% boost. So maybe that's what happened. Anyway, man, I spent too much time on announcements. Does anybody have any questions before we jump back into material? All right. Nice and easy. I'm glad to be back in person. Oh, so speaking of which, for you two who are here, um, what's, your, what's your names? Knox, yeah, and Schmidt, okay. I thought I would remember that. Anyway, if you don't mind, if you can remember, please email me afterwards to say that you were physically here, just as a reminder. All right, so that's it. We're all caught up with questions, uh, announcements, all that. So let me remind you of what we talked about, because it's been a while since we talked about Chapter 5. I'll back up. If anything, I told you, well, there we go. The most basic thing you learned was that first bullet point, or the most important thing so far, right? You learned some basic energy concepts. So make sure you understand the difference between kinetic energy and potential energy, right? That was a big thing from that. And know that when we're talking about potential energy, the new thing that may be new for you, maybe not. You know, usually when you learn about potential energy, you learn this. You know, if you have two different objects, you know, usually it's the one that's the higher has the most potential energy, right? That's what you learn in high school, middle school, and that's a true statement. But in this class, that's not important. When you think about potential energy in this class, what you should be thinking about is chemistry. Because as far as we're concerned, however much energy it takes to build a molecule, to squish those things together, that's how much energy is going to be released. So that's what we talk about potential energy in this course. We're talking about um, a specific type of potential energy, which is chemical energy. 
So those are the basics that you learn. There were some other things, but I don't have time to go through all of it. Another more very important thing that you learned at the end of that bullet point that you were about to go into now, and if you're going to take anything from this chapter, the one thing you should remember is this, this thing that we talked about. Your cells need ATP. So what energy, what is the energy source for all cells on Earth? It's ATP. Now, I want to make sure this is not confusing from what we said in chapter one. Ultimately, all the energy on Earth, with very few exceptions, came from the sun. So yes, all the energy comes from the sun. And there are some chemical processes that you're going to learn about later that bring us from the sun to ATP. But cells need ATP for energy. That will be a test question. It's very important. Cells need ATP for energy. Um, and this is a good time to back up really quickly to remind you from chapter one when we talked about those things that make us alive, right? Those properties of life. And one of those properties of life was that, well, life needs this conversion of energy from one form to another, right? So there you go. ATP, right? You need energy. So that's that. Another thing we learned about a property of life was that cells can regulate their environment, right? They can like maintain their pH, uh, maybe their temperature, you know, their salinity. There's all these things because basically they can control what comes in and out of the cells and that takes energy. So again, we're back to this idea of needing energy and again, another property of life. So that's why we're learning about this. Anyway, really quickly, and we've already talked about this at the end of uh, our last lecture, ATP, again, you need to know that that's what your chemicals need or your cells need for energy. And I described it differently than what is written here. And I said, basically, you could think of them ATP as batteries, right? But rechargeable batteries that all these different components in your cell need, need energy. Well, that's where they get it from, these rechargeable batteries that we call ATP. And now we are caught up. So now we can move forward. Do you guys have any questions online or in person about what we've said to get caught up? All right, let's move forward then. Here we are. This is where we left off. So remember back in chapter one, I told you that we're going to have this theme throughout the semester where there's a structure function thing, where we look at the structure and how it's related to the function and vice versa. And that's where we're going to start off with ATP. ATP, the word stands for adenosine triphosphate. You don't need to know that for the exam, but it's in the word and the word will maybe help you remember what the, um, what the structure is, triphosphate. Here's a picture of it. You've got this phosphate group with three phosphates. And I'm not probably necessarily going to ask you to remember the exact structure of ATP. I might give you a picture of it and have you recognize it, you know, like a, what do they call those things in a jail or you got the criminals lined up and say, that's the one. Anyway, you might have to do that with ATP, but most likely not. But I do want to talk about the structure. So earlier I said, as far as this class is concerned, however much energy it takes to build a molecule is how much energy is ready to be released when you break that molecule. And that's why ATP, as far as we're concerned, that is the reason why ATP is so powerful, why it has so much energy. It's all about the structure. Now, if you also remember last time we talked about this last week, I was saying, I asked you guys, I said, what's on the outside of an atom? And the answer is electrons. Someone got it right. And I said, okay, well, what charge are electrons? And someone correctly said negative. So that means these atoms are surrounded by negative things, right? So as far as we're concerned, the best way to think about it, even though this is not 100% accurate, it works for understanding this concept. These negative things repel each other, right? And as you try to push together um, like magnets that are the same polarity, they want to repel each other, right? Same thing with these atoms. They kind of want to push each other away. So it takes energy to push them together. And let's take that to the next level, keeping that in mind. Look at these things. These phosphate groups have a negative charge on them. So not only are they just the regular old negative because they have electrons on the outside, but they're even more negative because they have extra electrons. Another thing that you don't know because I haven't taught you and you don't necessarily need to know this level of chemistry in this class. Oxygens, uh, excuse me, oxygens themselves are a very negative atom, a very negative element. So that's a lot of oxygens, right? Very negative. Another thing that I didn't tell you, but you can hopefully this will make sense to you. Here we have double bonds. And remember, bonds are sharings of electrons, right? So obviously there's a lot of electrons being shared right there. Again, very, very negative. All this to say, 
those phosphate groups, those little balls are very, very negative. Therefore, it takes a lot of energy to squish those things together. Therefore, that molecule has a lot of energy ready to be released once you break those bonds. Yeah, so that's what I was getting at. All that being said, again, this thing right here <coughs> that you see, that's ATP. Now, when you knock one of these balls off, and I'm going to show you a picture of it later, so for now I'm just going to do this crude little line down the middle. When you knock one of those balls off, instead of having three phosphates, you have two phosphates, hence the name that new molecule is called ADP. So going back to my description where I said ATP was like a rechargeable battery, I'm going to get a little bit more specific now, and you will need to know this. ATP, that is the recharged battery. A lot of times when you see it in a textbook, it's drawn like this. There's like little squiggly lines that surround the ATP that's like, hey, look, this is energetic. Meanwhile, ADP at the bottom or in the middle there, ADP is like the dead battery. So you've already used the energy. You still have the battery. It's ready to be recharged, but it's not ready to give off energy. Does that make sense? ATP is the charged battery, so to speak, and ADP is the dead battery ready to be recharged. Are there any questions about this? All right. So again, when you're studying, remember, I'm not going to, you don't need to memorize anything about this exact structure. If anything, I'll show you a picture of this and you'll have to say, oh yeah, that's ATP. What I'm not going to do is give you three structures that look almost similar to this and say, all right, which one of these is the actual ATP, right? You don't need to memorize these exact shapes and those exact um, functional groups, nothing like that. So any questions about this slide? All right, let's move forward. Here's a drawing of what I was saying. So again, the information on this slide is not new. It's what we were just talking about. It's just drawn in a different way. Over here on the left, we have ATP, right? That's the charged battery. Like I said, the book usually puts it with little spikes around it to indicate, oh, it's full of energy. And then again, once your cells use those batteries, so to speak, you know, to release the energy, then what happens is you're left with ADP, which is, again, it's like the the dead battery that's ready to be recharged again. And your book also points out that when this happens, the phosphate, you know, that third phosphate, it doesn't just disappear. Um, it's actually transferred to another molecule. But as far as I'm concerned at this level, who cares? I don't, I'm not even going to ask you about that. I'm not going to ask you where the phosphate group goes. Just know this, it takes a lot of energy to make ATP, and it's all about those phosphate groups. And once you lose, once you break those bonds of ATP, that releases a lot of energy. And that's it. Any questions about this slide? All right. The second word for attendance, and you guys in person don't need to worry about it because you're in person, but online, the second word for attendance is going to be mask. This thing I'm holding right here, mask. Not a flask, which is what I have in my bag. No, I'm just kidding. I don't have a flask in my bag. If I did, I wouldn't admit to it. Anyway, here's a, this bullet point. This is what's next on your chapter, and I'm going to talk about it because I teach out of the book. So if you're following along, you know where we're at. But as far as I'm concerned, this is a not an important bullet point because I'm not going to ask you anything about it. And you don't necessarily need to understand this concept to understand the stuff that you're going to learn later in the semester. But here we go. Your book points out that ATP energizes other molecules by transferring the phosphate groups to them. And that's what I said earlier, right? I said it's not important, but just so you know... The ATPs or the phosphate groups don't just disappear when they leave the ATP. They actually go somewhere. Specifically, they are transferred to other molecules. Um, why is that important? How does that do anything? Well, a few things. In your book list, these three right here. It helps cells change shape. Um, so this picture at the bottom, which is not from your book, and you don't, definitely don't need to memorize it. It's just in the, an example. This shows you how like there's holes in the bottom of leaves because leaves need to be able to exchange gases, right? Leaves need carbon dioxide coming in and they need oxygen going out, right? So they need that. But at the same time, they also don't want to lose a lot of their water, meaning they'd have these holes or not meaning, but what I'm getting at is leaves have these holes because sometimes they need to be open so they can exchange gases. That's the picture on the left. Sometimes they need to be closed so they can, whoops, there we go. So they can retain their water. And that's the picture on the right. Anyway, I guess my point here is that's one of the reasons why it would be helpful for a cell to change shape. In this case, so a plant could maintain its water and gas balances. 
Um, here's a little bit more of an important one. I'm not going to ask you about it, but we're going to talk about this, this chapter. Using ATP enables the transport of different things across a membrane. So you remember your cell membrane, it lets some things in, it lets some things out, but it controls it. That's how it kind of controls its environment. So that's an important bullet point, not necessarily for the exam, because I'm not going to necessarily ask you about that. But it's important for understanding why we're even talking about this, because this is how cells maintain their environment. And maintaining your environment is one of those properties of life. And it's what you did in lab, right? You learned all about diffusion and osmosis. Well, um, your cell can control what comes in and out, and they use ATP to do it. And then finally, and this is going to be a little bit important in the next two chapters, when we're making new large molecules, which you should know as a dehydration reaction from the last exam, that takes energy, right? And where does the energy come from? It comes from ATP. So again, for the exam, this slide is not very important. Um, this is just more like saying, hey, why is ATP so important? And here we go. This is some more examples of why ATP is so important. Important. Again, cells just couldn't do what they do without ATP. And if there's one thing you remember from this chapter, that should be it. Cells need ATP for energy. All right, here's some pictures of what we're talking about. Uh, so when I move my arm like this, right, the muscles are contracting. That takes energy. What kind of energy? ATP. So uh, you can see the ATP transfers a phosphate group, and then that causes the muscle to contract. That's just an example. I'm not going to ask you anything about that on the exam. Same thing here. What you should know from the lab is that things diffuse, right? They go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And if you look closely at this picture on the right, those little purple balls, there's a lot of them on the inside of the cell, which is down here at the bottom. And there's not a lot of them on the outside of the cell, which is the top. So what you know, what you should know, is that things naturally want to diffuse in this picture. They want to diffuse out, right? They want to go from this area of high concentration to low concentration. However, whatever these purple balls are, whatever it may be, your cell needs it. So because of that, it's going to take some energy, right? Because things aren't going to naturally go from an area of low concentration to high concentration. That's like anti-diffusion. So it's going to take some energy to pump those things into the cell. And again, where does the energy come from? It comes from ATP. Specifically, ATP um, transfers that phosphate group. And for the exam, again, this isn't very important. But this concept that we're looking at will be important, very important in the next two chapters. Because when you learn about how um, photosynthesis works and how respiration works, it does involve pumping things against their concentration gradient. So that concept is going to come back. That's very important. It takes energy to do that. And then, of course, like I said on that other bullet point, when your body builds, when your cells build new molecules, it takes energy to do that. Like I said, right, when you push things together, atoms together, it takes energy to do that. Where does that energy come from? It comes from ATP. And that's it. So any questions about that? <coughs> All right. So here's probably the easiest thing I can say that I'm going to teach you about ATP is the ATP cycle. And in this exam, you're going to learn quite a few cycles. This is the easiest one I'm going to teach you for exam number two. The ATP cycle is the easiest thing. Remember, the way I describe ATP, it's like a battery, right? So ATP is the fully charged battery. ADP is the dead battery that needs charged. So here you go. It's pretty simple. Basically, you use it, right? You have ATP. That's your fully charged battery right there. You use it, a.k.a. you release uh, phosphate. So now you're down to ADP. You're down to the battery that's dead that needs to be recharged. Well, how do you recharge it? You get another energy source from somewhere else, and you add the phosphate tail back to it. That's it. Take a phosphate tail off of it to release the energy. Put a phosphate tail back on it to store the energy. So, again, that's the cycle. ATP is the fully charged battery. ADP is the dead battery. If anything, the hardest thing to remember, and I'm probably not going to ask you this, is when I say charge the battery and use the battery, specifically what I mean is when we're using the battery, we're releasing a phosphate. When we're charging the battery, we're adding a phosphate. Any questions? You good? Okay. Okay. You, you want me to say it again? Okay. So I'm saying like ATP, that's the fully charged molecule, right? 
or in other words, the fully charged battery. And when you use it, like we were talking about earlier, you're just getting off one of those phosphate groups, one of those three balls. So once you lose one and that releases the energy, that's why you're left with a DP. You only have two out of the three now. So that means that thing doesn't have any energy, relatively speaking. In this conversation, we'll just say, does it have any energy? So to recharge it, we got to take one of those balls that we took off and squish it back on. And all so, I'm... So then it turns back to Exactly, yeah. So yeah, take a... Once you, you have the ATP, once you lob one of those phosphate groups off, it is now without energy. But if you want to charge it back up, you put one of those balls back on. And of course, again, on the right-hand side, that's releasing the energy, right? So when you knock a ball off, then that releases energy. And then the opposite is true here. To put a ball back on, a phosphate group, a phosphate tail, however you want to say it, to put that back on, it's going to require an input of energy. So they're basically just the opposite of each other. Knock a ball off, it releases energy, but it takes energy to put it back on. Good question. Anybody, any other questions? All right. Let's see what time is it. Oh, we're doing okay. All right. Oh, and this is another just, this is a picture again of the same thing from your book. Except now there's a new term. It's, but if you're taking notes, you don't necessarily need to write this down because we'll talk about it later. So again, we're going from the fully energized ATP down to ADP, right? Because you've disconnected that phosphate from it and now it needs to be charged again but then when you put it back on that's this on the left hand side right it requires energy to put it back on and now the new information that we're going to talk about later technically this is cellular respiration so when we're talking about i like i said it takes energy to put that phosphate group back on well where do we get that energy from we get it from cellular respiration and again for now there's no need to even write that down we're gonna have a whole chapter on this right here this thing on the left that is chapter six chapter six tells us exactly this chapter six is all about how do we make atp so if i had to explain the next three chapters regarding the next exam i would say chapter five your cells need atp for energy chapter six is how we make um atp Chapter seven, well, we'll talk about that later. I don't want to give you too much information yet. So anyway, any questions about this slide? It's basically like the last slide, slightly different information. All right, here's some important stuff that you've already been slightly introduced to. Chapter three, we talked about different biological molecules, one of which was proteins. When we talked about those proteins, I showed you there's different things they do. There's structure, there's storage. And then at the end, I said on the right-hand side, there was enzymes. I said, that'll be important later. So here we are. So we were talking about a specific type of protein called enzymes. Very important. But to fully talk, to properly talk about them, you need to know this word, metabolism. And I'm sure you've heard it before, but in the context of this chapter, according to your book, Metabolism is all the chemical reactions that happens in an organism. And before we move forward, I'll let you know, we wouldn't be alive without all those chemical reactions. We are basically walking chemical reactions happening. And another thing to tell you about these chemical reactions is that almost none of them would just naturally happen. Because again, it's, you're trying to build these molecules for, as one example, and that takes energy to build molecules. Well, where does that energy come from? It comes from ATP. We already talked about that. And another thing, and this is the new information here, is that these chemical reactions require enzymes. So this portion right here of what we've talked about won't be on the exam. This is more like saying, why do we care about enzymes? Why are they important? Well, this is why. Because without enzymes, we wouldn't have these chemical reactions that happen in our bodies, in our cells, and without that, we would be dead. Uh, last name? Bunch, Bunch. okay. When, uh, just to help me remember, because I don't have my spreadsheet in front of me, when we leave, make sure you email me and tell me you came in late, so I'll have you down for attendance. Yeah, I saw you. But yeah, just you'll want to send me an email. Otherwise, I'll, I might forget, and I don't want that. It wouldn't be fair to you.
Anyway, so yeah, that's why enzymes are important. Without them, we wouldn't have these chemical reactions. And again, that's not trivial. Like we just would be dead without all these chemical reactions happening in our body. And that's about, you know, in the next two chapters, you're going to learn about a lot of those chemical reactions. Anyway, let's talk about some things that you do need to know about enzymes for the exam. First of all, like I've already said, enzymes are proteins. There are some exceptions, but as far as we're concerned in this class, there are no exceptions. Enzymes are proteins. Remember, there's all kinds of different proteins. There's the kind that make up your muscles. There's the kind that make up your hair. There's the, prote the storage proteins and eggs. And then there's the ones that we're concerned with right now, which are enzymes. For independent work, you can look that up, though, and look to see what the exceptions to the rule are. But as far as we're concerned in this class, all enzymes are proteins. How do they work? I'm going to get a little bit more specific later, but for now, you just need to know enzymes speed up chemical reactions. That's from your book. So know that enzymes speed up chemical reactions. Which almost trivializes it, in my opinion, because I think, and again, I teach out of the book, so I'll write what it says, but I think a better way to think of it is not that they speed up chemical reactions, which they do. It's more like they make chemical reactions happen that otherwise wouldn't happen. There's chemical reactions happening in your body that just wouldn't happen without the enzymes. And that, to me, is more important. Like, yeah, who cares about the speed? The fact is, without enzymes, they just wouldn't happen, and we, there wouldn't be life on Earth as we know it. But again, I teach from the book. Another thing to know about enzymes is they are not consumed in a chemical reaction. And that's a big one because what's going to happen is on the exam, I'm going to give you an equation, a chemical equation you've never seen before. And on the reactant side and the product side, you're going to see a word that you've never seen before. Well, you'll never, never have seen any of them in theory. But the idea here is that enzymes are not consumed, meaning in the chemical reaction, they're going to be on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So you have seen this chemical reaction. Uh, let me draw it here somewhere. You've seen glucose, and I'm going to abbreviate it, glucose plus galactose, and again, I'm going to abbreviate it, gives you la lactose. Right? We've already talked about that, lactose plus water. That's an equation you have seen. Now, in this case, I would also add the fact, because that chemical reaction I just drew, it wouldn't happen without a particular enzyme. Uh, I drew that backwards. Anyway, what I'm about to draw isn't technically accurate, but it doesn't matter because it's just an example. So if you were to see something where I wrote lactase, on the reactant side, lactase plus glucose plus galactose gives us lactose plus H2O plus lactase. And again, this is just an example. So if you're studying or writing notes, you do not need to memorize this reaction. First of all, because I messed it up. It's not even technically correct anyway. And second of all, because I'm not going to give you this reaction on an exam. The idea here is right here in the product side or reactant side is the word lactase. And then again, on the right hand side on the, of the products, you have lactase. So the fact that it's on both sides of the equation means this, it was not consumed in the reaction. And that's how you're going to be able to tell it's an enzyme. So when you get a question on the exam, where I give you a chemical equation you've never seen before, whatever you see on both sides of the equation, if it's on both sides, that means it's an enzyme. Um, another thing, I'll bring this up later too. All enzymes, as far as we're concerned, end with this three-letter word or this three-letter suffix ACE. If it ends with A S E, it's an enzyme. But I'll come back to that later. For now, just need you just need to know chemical reactions wouldn't happen without um, without enzymes. They're not used up in the chemical reactions. They're just there to help. Sort of like uh, baking cookies, right? You bring the flour and the sugar and the milk. Those are the ingredients. Those are the reactants. Put them in the oven for however, however long. And then at the end, you get the products, which is the cookies, right? You used a, um, excuse me, you used the oven, but an oven wasn't used up in the reaction, right? Same thing. You can think of enzymes as that. Enzymes are the things where these things happen, but they're not used up. Um, and that's what this picture is at the bottom.
Anyway, yeah, that's it for this. Any questions about this slide? All right, we'll move forward. Let's talk about how they work. You know that they're important. You know that they don't get used up. You know that they speed up reactions. Now let's talk about how it all works. And the first thing you need to understand is this concept called activation energy. And here it is, and you should know this for the exam. Activation energy is the energy invested to start a reaction. And if I were shorthanding and taking notes, you could even put activation energy needed to start reaction. And that's basically it. Because remember, like I said, it takes energy to squish these things together, right? Also, sometimes it takes energy to break things. Either way, the point is, chemical reactions, they require an input of energy. Some of them require a lot of energy. Some of them require a little bit of energy. But anyway, that's what activation energy is. So all these chemical reactions, as far as we're concerned, they all need some sort of input of energy. Like think about a ball, a ball rolling down a hill, right? If, it's, if you're on top of a hill and the ball is just sitting there, you just have to give it a little nudge. And that's it. Then there's a lot of potential energy that you're going to release, right? Once you give it that little nudge, it's just going to roll down the hill. It's going to get faster and faster. But you still had to give it that little nudge to begin with. So even though that reaction of the ball rolling down the hill is going to convert a lot of potential energy to kinetic energy, you still needed to put a little bit of energy in. And that's what activation energy is. It's the energy that you need to put in before the chemical reaction could happen. And a more scientific way of saying what I just said is these two bullet points here. It activates the reactants. It activates the reactants, which is another way of saying, you know, it's getting the ball rolling. It triggers the chemical reaction. But as far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't even worry about this, these two little bullet points. That first bullet point right here, that's the main thing. Know what activation energy is. It's the energy needed to get things started, get that ball rolling. And that's where, interim, that's where enzymes come in. So we already said that they speed up chemical reactions. And I already said that there's so many reactions that just wouldn't happen without enzymes. But now you're going to learn why. And this is a very important bullet point. How do enzymes work? This is the basic answer. We'll get more specific later. But the, really, the basic thing you need to know is this. Enzymes reduce the amount of energy required to break the bonds of reactant molecules. And again, if you're shorthanding, taking notes, you could just say this. Again, going back to the top. Activation energy is the energy needed to start a chemical reaction. Enzymes lower that. Then I'll use this example because I've used it before. I said, however much energy it takes to build a molecule, that's how much energy will be released once you break those bonds, right? And I use this as an example, a crossbow. I said, however much energy it takes you to pull that thing back, once you pull the trigger, that's how much energy is going to be released. Does that make sense? Now, how many of you guys have ever shot guns or crossbows or anything with a trigger? Have you guys shot anything like that? Hopefully you've shot multiple, well, not hopefully, hopefully for this discussion, you've shot multiple things and you might know some triggers are easier to pull than others, right? So you could almost think of an enzyme as switching out a trigger that's hard to pull and putting in a new one that's really light and easy to pull. Does that make sense? You still have to pull the trigger. You still have to put it in some energy to release that energy, but it's making it a lot easier. Matter of fact, some triggers are like, you barely touch them. That's kind of dangerous in my opinion. But some of them, you barely hit them and it starts it. That's what an enzyme is. It reduces the amount of energy that you need to put in there. Um, yeah, <clears throat> that's it. Again, using my analogy of like, all right, you've got a ball on top of a hill. That's a lot of potential energy that will be converted to kinetic energy as it rolls down the hill. But you still have to push the ball, right? So you can think of an enzyme as, I don't know, a bionic suit or a tool. So instead of just like pushing a big boulder, Maybe you've got a lever, right? And you're pushing it up and it makes it easier to push it off. That's all. It just makes it easier to start these reactions. The next word for attendance, and again, not for you guys in person because you're here, so you don't have to worry about it. But if you're online, the next word for attendance is this on the bottom of the picture right there, crossbow. So that is the next word, crossbow. Anyway, any questions about this slide? I talked a lot. Basically, just to say activation energy is the energy required to start chemical reactions and enzymes reduce the amount of energy needed.
That's it. It reduces the activation energy. Here's a picture of everything we said. So again, here are the reactants. You have this high energy molecule up here and the reactants. Then once you break those bonds, you release energy and it's a lower energy product. But before you can get from this high energy to this low energy, again, think of a ball rolling down a hill. You have to get over a little bit of something. That's the activation energy. And an enzyme just reduces it. Maybe that's the analogy I should have used. Instead of, I, I kind of described it like this, like you're on top of a hill and there's a boulder. And if you push it down, you know, it rolls and you convert the potential energy to kinetic energy. Maybe I should have described it like this, like you're on top of a hill with another hill and you've got that boulder. And you can convert that to some energy, right? But before you can get it to roll down this big hill, you've got to get it over this little hill, right? So that's activation energy. And I guess in this case, an enzyme would be like a little bulldozer taking that part of the inner, that part of the hill off. So now you just have to get it over a little bitty hill instead of a bigger hill. That's all it is. Any questions about that? All right. We're doing pretty good on time. <sighs> Every chapter has this, the process of science. And I will always skip it. I'm just reminding you of that. I always, again, highly recommend reading it. It's good to get your mind thinking scientifically. If we had more time, I would go through it. But since I'm not going to test you on it, I'm not going to spend time discussing it. But again, read it. If you have questions, let me know. And that brings us to the third bullet point of enzymes, enzyme activity. So we already know what enzymes are. And now we know how they work, basically. Remember, because they basically reduce activation energy. So let's find out how they do that. To talk about that, to have this discussion, you need to understand some words. And that's what we're about to talk about. First of all, yeah, I guess this is a kind of important bullet point. Yeah, this might be a test question. I'm almost positive this is a question on your study guide. And it might be a test question. First thing you need to know is enzymes are very selective. And what I mean by that, it's like I keep saying that we need enzymes for all these chemical reactions that are happening in your body. But it's not like there's just one enzyme that can do all these different chemical reactions. They're very selective. Usually there's like one enzyme that does this one very specific chemical reaction. And the way that happens is usually an enzyme only works on one substrate. And you need to know this word. What is a substrate? That's the reactant molecule. That's the thing that it's doing its job on. So the substrate is the reactant molecule. That's the thing that's going through the chemical reaction. Now the substrate, and you can see this picture here at the bottom, there's the substrate. The substrate fits into the enzyme at a place called the active site. You need to know that too. Not necessarily, I don't know if I'm gonna ask you about it, but I'm gonna be using these words for probably half the semester, so you need to know what they are. The active site is where the substrate fits. And you can notice too with this picture, it looks like a little puzzle piece. And that is really how it works in real life. The enzymes are very specific. And I told you in the last chapter when we talked about proteins, I said, what's the most important thing about a protein? It's shape. And that includes this particular type of protein, which are enzymes. Very important is their shape. Because their substrates actually do have a particular shape. And if the shape doesn't match the shape of the substrate does not match the shape of the enzyme, then they just won't fit together and that won't happen. That's one of the ways it's so selective. You guys, I'm sure when you were in kindergarten or prior to that, had that game where you put little blocks in, right? If it was a circle, you put it in the circle hole. If it was a star, you put it in the star hole. This is that. It's, it's really that at a molecular level. The pieces have to fit. So anyway, that's the substrate. The substrate fits into the active site. So those two things are nouns. This other word I'm teaching you right here, that's a verb. When you put the substrate into the active site, we call that the induced fit. Specifically, as your book describes it, it is the entry of a substrate, or it is when the entry of a substrate induces the enzyme to change the shape. Basically, it's like saying, the substrate kind of comes in all loosey-goosey. And then once it's in there, the enzyme's like, all right, now I'm ready. And it tightens up. 
And that's why I have this picture on the left here. Can anybody tell me what this picture is? Uh, what this picture is? Those silhouettes. What is that? What are they doing? Well, if you you can guess what they're doing. As long as you don't get too creative, you'll probably guess it right. What are these hugging. two doing? Are they yeah. hugging? Hugging, yeah, they're hugging. So she could be the substrate, and he could, I mean, I hate to assume genders, I don't know, but it just looks, I don't know, to me that looks like a male and a female, whatever. He's the enzyme, she's the substrate. So think about how hugs work. They end like this, right? With arms like this. You're holding somebody if it's a good hug, but they don't start like that. Like, I'm not going to hug Knox here. But if I did, I wouldn't come at you like this. That's not going to work, right? We'd have to start like this. You start with open arms. Then once you come in, then you bring the arms around. That's the induced fit is when you bring the arms around. And that's basically what enzymes do. They've got to start open because they're just waiting for these molecules to float into their spot. But once they come in, then you get the induced fit. So again, know these words. Substrate fits into the active site. And when that happens, then you get the induced fit. Any questions? It's fairly simple stuff. Okay, so again, the substrate comes into the enzyme. Then the enzyme kind of wraps around it, right? It's, it strengthens, it kind of squishes it. That's the induced fit. And then afterwards, after, you know, it maybe in this case breaks a bond, in this case, so you remember we had this substrate that's like a half a circle and a triangle. That's the molecule. In this particular reaction, we're breaking that. So we're turning that one molecule into these two different molecules, like a little round thing and a triangle. Once that happens, right, again, it came into the active site. We had the induced fit. Some magic happened, whether it be literally, it could be because the enzyme, like, literally broke the bonds, like, with tension, so to speak. Or it could be some other stuff that we'll talk about later. But what happens is once it's done, the products leave. And you can see now this enzyme on the very bottom right. Now that the products are gone, it thing's ready to do its job again. And that's what I was talking about when I said way back, to, uh, not way back, uh, not too long ago when I said enzymes are not used up in chemical reactions. And that's how. The substrate comes in, it does its job, the products leave, and the enzyme's ready to do its job again. So again, on the exam, when you see a chemical reaction that you've never seen before, if there's something on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, that is the enzyme. And again, like I said earlier, and now you see it officially in writing, they end with the, the suffix ace. So if I give you, I might even make up a chemical reaction that doesn't even exist and just throw, make up some words that don't exist. But if it ends with the word A or the letters A-S-E, that is the enzyme. So it'll end with ASE, it'll be on both sides of the equations, and that's how you're going to know it's an enzyme. Another thing, and this is new, I haven't told you this yet, many enzymes are named for their substrates. So to give you a real-life example, there's an enzyme called lactase, ends with ASE, that breaks up lactose, right? So lactase is named after lactose. So in the exam, I might give you that question, I might give you an equation, and you have to, and I might ask you, what's the substrate? And the first thing you need to do is identify the enzyme. And again, you could identify it because it's on both sides of the equation. It ends with the letters ACE. And then once you know what the enzyme is, just look for the word that looks like that. And that is what its substrate is. <clears throat> so any questions about this slide? All right, moving forward. Here's a picture of everything we talked about. Oh, that's actual lactase, what I was talking about. So there's lactase. It's an enzyme. Its whole job is to break the molecule lactose up. It's ready to go. Its active site is empty. So here it comes. Here comes lactose. Looks like a dumbbell. It comes in. It binds to the active site. Oh, here's something to remind you. Not that it matters too much anymore. But hey, if we're breaking, an, <laughs> breaking a reaction, it's a hydrolysis reaction, right? So we use water to break it up. Anyway, we use a little bit of water. The enzyme does its magic. Now we go, we no longer have the lactose anymore because the enzyme did its job. It broke it. So now we have glucose and galactose, right? They're ready to go. And now they've emptied, right? They've gone. And the enzyme again, it's empty. The active site's empty. And it's ready to do its job again. Any questions about that? All right. The last word for attendance for those of you online is going to be sticker. 
like i don't know if you guys can see this there's a sticker on my computer that's the last word again you three who are here don't need to do um words you just need to email me to remind me you guys were here on time you, you came late yeah that's it so when we come back on friday we're gonna knock out these enzymes and then hopefully finish chapter five any questions about anything all right hopefully i'll see you guys on lab today i'll be there i have a question yes um i have computer sticker and crossbow are those the only words no not gonna tell you <laughs> that's correct i'm not gonna tell you i'm sorry it's just part of making sure that you're paying attention or maybe it's not even your fault maybe you were watching something and then your cat puked on your carpet and you had to go take care of it either way you missed the word even if it's not your fault you missed that portion of the uh of the um lecture but i will be posting the video so if you send me the three the words that you have now and then later when you see the video you can send me the other one but make sure you send me the words that you have now for I'm sure, sorry. For sure. i know it's a pain i'm so sorry but that's just the way it's it is. all cool oh, it's all cool it's, all it's right good. Any other questions? Um, can, Wait, can is we... it mask? What is it? Is it mask? I can't tell you. <laughs> Why can't you? All right. <laughs> All right. Can, can All right. So that's it. I'm going to log off now so the next people can get the classroom, and then I will be on for office hours. I'll be there if you need me. All right. There we go.